I should tell you, I'm texting on my watch in the live stream to see how the live stream's doing. I don't normally pick up my phone during the service. What could be more important than worshiping the Lord? But I'm trying to get this right. So, um, Emily, I mean, Elsie, have you seen that little sign that bandwidth is too low or something? No. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter uh, 7. John chapter 7. And I want to encourage you. As Andrew prayed, he prayed that we would give with a willing heart. That's a great request. And as you know, our giving to our missionaries is 10% of the offerings that come in. And this last we were able to give our uh, missionaries that are couples, we, we do it by units, the ones that got two units, almost $500 for three months. Now, I know as a missionary, often when the economy changes, some churches, they, they can't even give you the baseline, if you will. And so the fact that we were able to give them a little bit extra because of your faithfulness to give, thank you. And uh, know that uh, God is using uh, your our funds around the world to get the gospel out. John chapter 7. This morning we saw uh, how much we owe Jesus. And I want us to be Christians who are in love with the Savior. God, we love Jesus. We, we love his people. Um, and we love the, his creation, the, the, the people that he's created, even the ones that are our enemies. Jesus said to love our enemies and pray for them that persecute you. And uh, we want to be that kind of people. Last Sunday morning, we looked at the heart of the matter, and it was that we need to love God. And that's what where revival starts. It starts in my heart. It starts with my attitude. Now, tonight I want to expand on that. I want to expand on that and talk about the spirit of the matter. And the spirit of the matter is, indeed, the Holy Spirit. Revival is uh, directly tied to the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of God's people. The good news is, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 says, what? Know ye not that your body is uh, the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. So all of us that are Christians, we have the Holy Spirit. The truth is, we're not all filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that because in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul writes to the believers there at, Ephes at Ephesus, the Ephesians, and he says, Be filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit dwells in us, but it doesn't always fill us. And... Uh, we, we want to be Holy Spirit filled Christians. So we're going to we're going to be looking toward your seven. I mentioned six questions about revival, and I'm going to ask some of those tonight. And those six questions are as follows. If you're trying to write them down, I'm going to go too quickly through through them to get them this first time, but I'll go through them a second time you can get them. First question: What is the definition of revival? When a preacher gets up and he says, We're praying for revival, what is it? that we're praying for? That's the first question. Second question, and similarly, what do we expect to happen when we experience a revival? You know, if we don't know what we're looking for, we're likely to miss it, or we're likely to go after the wrong thing. So what is it when that we ex expect to happen when we experience a revival? When I was a, a young man in the 90s, they had a revival in the Toronto area. They called it a laughing revival. And people were literally laughing, falling down on the ground, rolling around, <laughs> laughing hysterically. And I searched my Bible. I can't find any evidence that that is a sign of revival. Now, I'm glad that they were finding whatever was hilarious. I actually am not because they were attributing to the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit only does, he only works in certain ways. And, and, uh, we want to be able to identify when it's the Holy Spirit at work. So that's another question I'm going to ask you here in a minute. And when you think of revivals in the past, who are some of the names, the names, the people that come to mind? Fourth question, can you name a revival and a preacher of revival that is not an English speaker? I ask this question because I was starting to go through these names, and all these names are people who speak English. They may, might be from America might be from Scotland, but they all were English speakers, so I had to challenge myself on that one. Number five, the fifth question, what are the hindrances to revival? And then the sixth question, in other words, why aren't we experiencing revival? I mean, we want it, right? We, as Christians, 
We desire for there to be revival. So why is it that we don't experience it more often? What are the hindrances? And then number six, why do you want revival? Now let's go back to each of those and I'm going to give you a chance to respond. So put your thinking caps on, fire them up, and let's look at that first question. What is a definition of revival? What is revival? And if you say something that's completely off the wall, I'll just turn around and I'll laugh without looking at you. Okay? But uh, seriously, I don't think that'll happen tonight. I, I will correct you if you say something completely off the wall, but uh, don't hesitate to take some guesses is what I'm saying. Shot in the dark, right? Yes? Holy Bible is derivative of the word to revive, generate, to go back to do something. Exactly. To, to revive, to regenerate, to bring people back to life. That's, that's what we call it, revival. So what is it that we are reviving? Not our physical lives, because I'm alive and feel pretty strong. Sometimes I wish I could take a shot of uh, energy from these little kids, like <laughs> Stephen or Caleb uh, 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 Marfil. They just have all this energy. I mean, they just it's 90 degrees out there, and they're running around. I wish I could drain off some of their energy and shoot it in my arm. Uh, but seriously, that's not, it's not the physical life that's revived, is it, that's revived? Anyway, spiritual. spiritual life, right? Think about when you were first saved. I can think back as a little boy when I was first saved. I really, really wanted <laughs> to please God. I had this, it seems now, in retrospect, it seems like a hypersensitivity to sin. Things that, boy, I shouldn't do that. That I'd always done before. And periodically through my life, as, as I've experienced a, a personal renewal, you know, God starts to put his finger on things, and I say, okay, you're right, Lord, I'm going to give that up. And then he puts, okay, I'll give that up. Okay, yeah, and, I, and you need to do this. Okay, I'll do that. What we're looking for in revival is that renewal of the same life that we had when we were first saved. Now, if you don't remember what it was like to first be saved, well, that's, that's going to be hard for you. But that's what we're looking for in renewal. Number two, so what are going to be some of the evidences, the indications of revival? If, if someone were to come in and they just sort of scan the crowd here, obviously they're not going to see necessarily in five minutes. But let's imagine they scan the crowd here. They followed us around for a week. They did a little documentary and we were experiencing revival, what are some of the, the outward manifestations? Now remember, revival is in the heart. But what would be some of the outward manifestations that they might see? Just give me one at a time. Yes? We would show more love to those around us. Yeah, there would be a greater sense of love for others. Yeah, excellent. What, what's another? That's a good one. What's another? Yes, WT. Meekness. Yeah, there would be a spirit of humility and meekness. There, we easily yield our pride. We wouldn't fight with each other over the things that were not scriptural. We would be necessarily um, towards you, you'd be able to respond with that meek spirit because the Holy Spirit would be directing you and giving you grace for that. Excellent. What's another one? Joy. Joy. Now, I want you to think about the first three things we mentioned. Love, meekness, and joy. Where do you see those coming from? Fruit of the, Spirit. the fruit of the Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit fills us, that's the natural expression. Love, joy, peace, uh, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. That's just the natural expression of the Holy Spirit filling you. You don't have to work it up. You see, the wrong way to approach revival, and sometimes we've approached, approached revival this way, we say, okay, we need to be more loving. Okay, good. And so we go out and think, okay, how can I be more loving? That's, it's backwards. We need to be filled with the Spirit, and then we will be more loving. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Then we will have that spirit of meekness that yields our rights, that humbles ourselves before God, and sometimes before man. We'll have that, uh, that joy that we ought to have. We'll have that temperance. So, yeah, excellent. There's a couple other things, but we're going to, hit some of these as we go. One of the one of the key indicators you're going to see in any revival is a boldness to give the gospel to others. Because again, when the Holy Spirit's filling me, 
I am bold to give others the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm walking in the flesh, I really find it hard to share the gospel with people. Because this hindrance comes up, they're not going to believe you. You don't know them very well, and you know, obviously they're not Christians, otherwise you'd be sharing the gospel. Why are you giving it to them? That's the flesh talking to me. When I'm filled with the Spirit, it's natural to look for those opportunities to talk about Jesus Christ <coughs> and how they can have their sins forgiven and spend eternity with God. Okay, so that's another one that is really important. There's actually another one. Ah, okay, let me give you one more. Prayer. There's renewed purpose in prayer. I would guess the average... I, I'm guessing, I have very little to base this on, but I would guess the average American Christian, or the average American who says, I'm a Christian, prays very little. Biblically prays very little. I'm speaking in tongues a bit for two hours in the morning, and what did you pray about? I don't know. You know, the Spirit led me to do what? Uh, I don't know. But, but I'm not talking about that type of prayer. Biblical prayer, probably five minutes a day, seven minutes a day. And I was challenged, uh, recently a pastor was, was talking to other pastors, and <laughs> he's praying an hour a day. Now, I know he's a pastor, he's got some time to set that aside, but there would be a renewed purpose that we have got to go to God in prayer. Not because the pastor is beating us, you know, you better pray more! And not because our spouse is going to ask us, okay, how much did you pray today? Well, I prayed for seven minutes. That beat you. No, not because of that. Because we recognize the importance of prayer in accomplishing God's will. Third question. When you think of some revivals in the past, what are some of the names that come to mind? Yes. Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. Boy, I'm glad you got that one. The first great awakening. In fact, Americans, we pulled this word revival from his book. He wrote a book, and I wrote the name down because I would remember. There it is. No. There it is. Some Thoughts Concerning the Present Revival of Religion in New England. He wrote it in 1742 and uh, was documenting what we call now the First Great Awakening in the United States. So yeah, Jonathan Edwards. Yes. Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday. Yeah, Billy Sunday. What's another name we think of? George Whitfield. George Whitfield, who also, he served in England, he preached in England. He also preached in the United States in Jonathan Edwards Church. Jonathan Edwards and he were, were friends. They knew each other personally. And uh, so he was part of the revival that was going on in England. Who else was involved in that revival in England in addition to George Whitfield? Anyone remember? Two boys. Wesley. Wesley. John and Charles Wesley. Which reminds me, often in revival you'll see a new spirit of singing. And Charles Wesley uh, illustrates that. For those of you that uh, since high school, England was headed for problems. Um, there's a series of paintings, of drawings, and etchings by a man whose name is Hogarth. I think his first name is William, but his last name is Hogarth, illustrating how wicked, how wicked English society had become. People just drinking alcoholic beverages all day and indulging in all kinds of wickedness because of that. And, and uh, the, the, the progress of, of, a, of a young lady who leaves her home in the country, comes to the city to find success and ends up in the gutter. The progress of a young man who leaves his city, uh, his place in the countryside, comes to the city, ends up in the gutter. And he was mocking, he was a satirist, he didn't care about these people, he was just mocking how badly Englishmen were behaving. And yet after the Wesleys, after George Whitfield, after that revival of religion in England, there was a new spirit of missionary sending in the late 1700s. And out of that comes uh, William Carey and, and uh, others. So again, the revival there, some people credit that revival in England by the Wesleys. Not by the Wesleys, by the Holy Spirit. But the Wesleys being a primary driver in that. They credit that revival with England's ability to avoid what happened in the French Revolution. In the French Revolution, you have these people rising up, throwing off their masters, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and then in, in, engaging in a reign of terror, that's the literal name for what we call it, until it was ended by a dictator, Napoleon. And uh, I'll, I'll be frank, one of the reasons I'm, not the main reason, but one of the reasons I'm burdened is that's what will happen in the United States. There'll be, I don't know when, 
not necessarily this year, but there'll be anarchy to the point that a strong man has to stand up and say, I'm going to put an end to this. But he's going to have to be a dictator to do it. And uh, I was with Ken Lynch. I, I might have mentioned this to you. I was with Ken Lynch. He, his uh, relative, we had gone to see his relative down in uh, oh, somewhere on the East Bay. And uh, she uh, was a little girl and was born in, in um, Nazi Germany, created after World War II. She said, that's just what happened that allowed Hitler to come to power in Germany. Uh, you had a uh, people fighting in the streets, communists and, and fascists fighting in the streets, and Hitler comes along and says, I can put an end to this chaos. And he puts an end to the chaos, but at what expense? The thing that saved England from that was spiritual revival. And that's why I believe, because I believe in a God of judgment who is just, that unless Christians in America turn back to the Lord, Unless we are filled with the Spirit and we find that renewed purpose in prayer and that boldness to preach and the fruit of the Spirit, the love and the meekness and the joy, unless we find that again, then we're headed for destruction of our Constitution. And uh, so, yeah. Okay, how about a person who's a revival, or a person or a revival that is not in an English-speaking country? I had, to, I had to go back and look at some... Well, there's one that come, two could come to mind, but, but not in an English-speaking country. Christy knows one of them. Yes? Well, you want someone that didn't speak English or not in an English-speaking country? Yeah, not in an English-speaking country. That'll work. Well, that would be Gladys Allward. Yes, in uh, in China. And and uh, the one that my wife and I read is Jonathan and Rosalind Goforth. Oh, yeah. I don't know if any of you have read How I Know God Answers Prayer... Uh, one of you not here tonight has been reading that book by his wife, Rosalind Goforth. How I Know God Answers Prayer, because they had seen it personally. Yes? Martin Luther? Yeah, in, in the Reformation was, in a sense, a revival. The, the one distinction I would make is I think a lot of those people got saved. They weren't already saved. They got saved because of the Reformation in, in uh, Germany. But that's well, a good the, one. The fat guy got appointed to a coup. The guy got appointed to stay there. John Huss? Yeah, there was a, a group in Czechoslovakia, the Moravians, who also experienced revival. And then there's an East African revival. Any of you ever read a book by Roy Hessian? Um, no? Okay. Anyway, what are the hindrances to revival? By the way, one of the reasons we're meeting inside tonight is I want to take our time on this. And when I preach outside, I get hot. And I feel like I'm overheating, so I tend to keep it short. But we're stopping. What is a hindrance to revival? What would keep us from experiencing revival? The obvious answer is sin. So that's that's the easy one. When I was a boy uh, and we did family devotions, uh, I have two younger brothers. And my brother Robert's about four years younger than I was. And I was in uh, first and second grade. So I was six and seven. He would have been two and three years old. And every time my dad asked him a question about the devotional, you know, what happened, Robert? My brother would say, God. <laughs> it was a pretty good guess. Uh, and so uh, similarly, sometimes what is a hindrance or about sin? Yeah, that's true. So God, let's get that one out of the way. Let's be a little more specific than that. WT. Pride. Pride. That's the top one on my list. Pride. And frankly, what, the, what pride will most likely look like in my life I don't experience revivals when I say, I don't really need the Holy Spirit right now. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I really am. You know, my, my wife is, I mean, she's pretty happy. You're happy with me, right? Okay. My children, they're, they're not doing anything crazy. And, you know, my church, you guys all look nice tonight. That's the problem, not the solution. The problem is when I feel like I'm doing pretty well. And, you know, the Holy Spirit's nice and I'm glad he's indwelling me. But I, I've got this. That's the problem. That is the, that is the problem. It's when we come to God and we say, God, I can't be the husband I want to be without the Holy Spirit. I can't be the father that you want me to be without the Holy Spirit. I can't be the witness you want me to be, be without the Holy Spirit. And in my case, I can't be the pastor you want me to be without the Holy Spirit. That opens the doors to... There's one other thing that I would mention, and that is unbelief. There's a spirit of unbelief sometimes says, well, God's not going to send revival for whatever reason. And uh, the most common reason among Americans today that I've experienced is I've talked, well, you know, we're coming to the end of, of the, we're coming to the last days 
and there's going to be an apostasy, there's going to be a great falling away. And by the way, I agree with that statement that there'll be a great falling away. I just am not ready to admit that we're in it yet. And I was reading, um, yeah, last night we, we met for prayer there in Luke. <clears throat> Nevertheless, when he cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Right? There will be a time Jesus is going to come for his saints. We don't call it the second coming. We call it the rapture of the church. And when he comes, I believe faith is going to be at a very low ebb. But not on my watch. Ezekiel 22.30 challenged me since I was a young man. I looked for a man among them to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. And I found none. But I don't want that to happen in my generation. So... I know God the Father knows when his son is coming for his church. I'm going to leave that in his hands. While I'm here, I'm going to work my best to continue to be Holy Spirit filled and to encourage all of you to be Holy Spirit filled. Diane. Amen. Could another um, hindrance, and I'm thinking specifically right now of America, but it may have been the case in England at the fear because there's so much sin and so much open rejection of Christianity, Christ, the Bible, everything right now. Nobody wants to. Bad, you don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be bold enough to. Right, fear. You know, Diane, I've never thought about that before, but that just reminds me how small my mind is. Uh, that, that's, that's been true in the past, where the, a hindrance to revival has been this thought well, you know, we don't want to make waves, right? Who wants to rock the boat, right? It's already enough problems. We don't need to worry about rocking the boat. We need to worry, and, and Diane is not saying we do. Let me just help us through this. We just want to be spirit-filled. Will being spirit-filled rock the boat? Well, let me ask you, was Jesus spirit-filled? Yeah. Did he rock the boat? Yeah. yeah. He made a lot of people angry, not because he did anything wrong, but indeed because he spoke truth and because he lived truth. But you're right. We can't let fear be that. It can be, but it should not be that hindrance to revival. Last question. Why do you want revival? And I'm going to tell you the number one reason that we all want revival is because we want to see God glorified. Amen. And we're not seeing that right now in the United States. Turn on your tele don't. <laughs> uh, turn on your television. Just sort of browse the channels. Do you see Jesus Christ being glorified? Now, by the way, I think television is a bad medium to glorify. We can have that discussion another time. But but you don't. Go to your local library, the Solano County Library, just sort of browse almost any section. Do you see Jesus Christ being glorified? I don't. Do you realize that in previous revivals, not so much the first Great Awakening, but in the second Great Awakening that happened in the uh, 1850s, they were actually printing the sermons of the evangelists in local newspapers? That happened again in the early uh, 1900s. There would be these preachers, they would come to town, and they would come in, and they would be preaching the gospel, and they would print their their messages in the newspapers. There were circuits of preachers that would come around in the summer and people's uh, summer vacation would consist of going to a Bible camp and camping there and hearing the preaching for a whole week or two. So we want revival because we want God to be glorified. And as I mentioned, a secondary reason is because we know that God is a God of judgment. He's a holy God. And that without revival, we're headed as a country for God's judgment. Whether it's that judgment that's described in the book of Revelation or another judgment, I, I don't know, but who's righteous and he must judge sin. Don't think that if a revival comes, it'll be easier for us. As Diane wisely mentioned, it could actually be harder for us. Because as we're Holy Spirit-filled and we're living in that Spirit-filled life, there is going to be rejection. There is going to be people that say, they're the problem! But we can be assured that God will protect his own. And I don't mean by that you know, we'll never face any persecution. What I mean by that is that God will be glorified in our, in our lives. Okay, let's look at uh, uh, John chapter 7, verse 37. And I'm just going to give you the first point tonight. And I'll give you the other two points uh, next Sunday. Uh, probably next Sunday night. I have another sermon ready for, for Sunday morning. John chapter 7 and verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast. Okay, now, we, we have to um, go back to verse 2 here. John 7 verse 2 says this, Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand.
And this is the last day, the great day of this Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles is described for us in the book of Leviticus. It's a chance for the Israelite people, the Jewish people, to remember their wanderings in excuse me, their wanderings in the wilderness. So they built themselves these little huts. They would live in the huts and they'd bring out these palm leaves and different fruits. And one of the big events, the last day of the feast, one of the big events, um, I, I was hoping to get a picture of the of Jerusalem, but it's going to be hard to I, I imagine. Okay, watch, I'm going to move around. Imagine this is Jerusalem. This is south. I know this is south, but then Jerusalem, this is south and this is north. And the reason I choose north is it gradually slopes up. And at the highest point of the city, uh, the Hasmoneans and later Herod the Great expanded it. They built a great big platform out of stone. You remember seeing the stones, some of them that are still there, that formed the, 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 uh, the, the structure, not the structure, the uh, foundation of that building. They built this great big platform. So anywhere you were in the city, whether it was to the south or to the east, or if you're on the west, excuse me, to the west or to the east where the uh, Mount of Olives was, you saw this imposing picture of the temple. And down at the very southeast corner of the city is the and you wash in the pool of sea and you have to go down there anyway, you wash off. The pool of Siloam is in the very southeast corner. And on the great day of the feast, the last day of the feast, there were some priests. They would go all the way down to that pool of Siloam. They would draw water. And they would bring the water, and they'd have to climb up, 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 up. There was even steps, but steep slope, all the way up to the temple. They'd come into the temple, and they would pour out that water. Now, remember, the, the Feast of the Tabernacles is commemorating the wilderness wandering. So what would that act of taking the water and pouring it out there in the temple, what would that act of? Anyone? When Moses was split the rock. Yeah. When they were thirsty. And Moses struck the rock, and out comes water in the desert. So keep that in mind. Jesus says, verse 37, in that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So you see what Jesus is doing here. He's taking their knowledge of the wilderness wanderings and the water gushing out of the rock and he says if you believe on me you're going to have that gushing water out of your belly it's going to come out of you and this is as the people the last day of the feast they're going to see those priests walking walking up 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 finally getting up to the temple pouring out that water to remind uh, the jewish people that god had provided water in the wilderness god still provides living water to Jesus at the well, talking to the good, uh, the good Samaritan, talking to the Samaritan woman. If, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for water. You'd never have to drink again. Not talking about the physical water that we drink. Talking about what? The Holy Spirit. How do I know it's the Spirit? Because look at verse 39 with me. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, when was that Holy Spirit given in a marked and a remarkable way? Anyone? Pentecost. Pentecost. Yes. 50 days after his resurrection. And by the way, all of these are tied to the feast. And that would be a fun study, but a little less to um, 50 days after the resurrection, they're praying, the, 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 the apostles and about 120 Christians gathered together praying and the Holy Spirit falls on them. And everybody in Jerusalem quickly hears there is something strange going on. You see, Acts, the reason it's so hard for us to live out the book of Acts is because we don't allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us as those early Christians allowed the Holy Spirit to flow through them. Jesus said, out of his belly shall come rivers of living water. Not droplets, not a thin stream, not just a, rivers of living water. And he's speaking of the Spirit. So, number one. Ready? We're 30 minutes into the sermon. First point. Crave. 
He says, if any man thirst, do you crave, I'm serious, do you crave the Holy Spirit? Now, one of the problems we have in understanding this passage is it's probably been a long time, maybe never, since you were truly thirsty. Probably the closest person would be Logan over here. I don't know, maybe they, did you do your basic during the summer in Lackland? Okay, so you might know thirst. But the rest of us, the last time we were thirsty, we went over to the sink in our house, or we went to the refrigerator, we turn on the, the faucet, and drinkable water comes out. Or we go to the refrigerator, and we take the cap off of a, off of a bottle of water, and we drink it, and we have water. Today, I got done preaching. Doyle looks at me. He says, do you need water? I thought, yeah, I need water. So he goes over to the cooler, he pulls out one, and he hands me, and I had water immediately. But understand, in this day, water was not available like that, especially outside of a city. Now, in Herod's time, they would have built aqueducts to bring water to the cities. But if you're just wandering through the countryside, you don't just find a rest area and drinkable water. You don't just stop at your friend's house and, and he turns on the faucet and out comes water. I was reminded of this when we were traveling through the countryside of Mongolia, and traveling through the Mongolian countryside is, is really like going back in time. We got out to a part of the Mongolian countryside, uh, foreigners just don't go there. Uh, we were there because our friend's family was there. But they knew all the watering holes. Yeah, two kilometers, they go kilometers. And two kilometers from here, there's water, but it's sort of salty. And so we like to go five kilometers over here because there's the better water. Or, Three kilometers over there, there's water in May, June, and July as the snow melts. They knew all this. Why? If you don't know where the water is, you will thirst and die. That's the type of society where they struck the rock and water gushes out. That's the power of God, the arm of the Lord revealed that we talked this morning. And Jesus says, listen, if any man thirsts, Jesus, I mean, I'm not exactly sure where he was, but the idea is it must have been standing somewhere in the temple where everyone could hear him, and they're gathered there. It's the last day, the great day of the feast. They're waiting for those uh, priests to come up from the pool of Siloam with the water, and all of a sudden, some guy has the gall to yell out, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. I'm sure the priests and specifically the uh, Sadducees who ran the temple thought, some man, and get him out of here. He is, he is destroying this ceremony. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Right. But I'm telling you, there were a lot of people in the temple that day, they heard that cry, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. And they thought, who is this madman crying out? Why? Because they weren't thirsty, were they? Now, I'm asking you tonight, are you thirsty for the Holy Spirit? Because, frankly, a lot of times as Christians, we're not. Like I said, the WT mentioned pride. We sort of figure, hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm a good father. I'm a good husband. I'm a good pastor. I mean, I'm a good guy. I mean, I go out and I knock doors now and then, and I share the gospel this week. So what more can I do? Well, Jesus doesn't say, if any man thirst, let him come into me, and I'll give him a bunch of actions to do, right? We can say, well, I don't dance, and I don't go to movie theaters. By the way, if, <laughs> I won't go down that road. I don't go to movie theaters, and I don't play cards, and uh, and I don't smoke, and, and so then I'm, I'm pretty good. No, Jesus isn't saying if any man is in a really bad state of sin. He says if any man thirsts, and I tell you, we are walking through a spiritual desert every day. And without that water that gushes out of that stream that, that, that God the Father sends to us, there isn't water out there. And I, I know some of you have asked me, oh boy, it's, you know, we've got this pandemic and all these different things going on. And how do you, in fact, someone told me this week, I, I, I really think you're an optimist. I said, no, I'm not an optimist. When I walk in the flesh, I'm a pessimist. I'm sure that those things are going to blow down this week and Jesse's going to spend all that time in vain and it's going to be 100 next week and people aren't going to come. I can tell you all the bad things that will happen. So where do I find that joy, that meekness, 
that love for people. Because out of the belly of the man who believes in Jesus will flow rivers of water. Amen. You need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't come by just walking through life. It doesn't come unless we want it. Jesus said, if any man thirsts. So why is it that we're not more thirsty? I've asked myself this question because, frankly, I, I do. I tend to live without seeing the power of the Holy Spirit in a vibrant way in my life. So why isn't that I why is it that I don't see more of the Spirit? Well, one reason is we're not thirsty. And we're not thirsty because frankly it's easier to live in the flesh than it is to live in the spirit. We want to know the dichotomy clearly, and we won't teach I won't teach this tonight. I've taught it before, I'll teach it again, I'm sure. Again. <coughs> Romans chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which walk not after the flesh. Um and I won't quote the whole passage, but here's here's Paul's point. You can either live in the flesh or you can live in the spirit. And frankly, the truth is it's easier to live in the flesh. That's what feels natural, what feels normal. Because when I was born, when I was born, I was living in the flesh, wasn't I? My parents didn't have to teach me how to lie and how to fight with my brothers and how to curse people. I mean, I learned that on my own. That was, that's what's natural. That's why we talk about man is fallen and we're, we're, we're sinful. Uh, uh, David says, in sin, my mother conceived me. He's not talking about the act of his mother. He's talking about when I was conceived, I already had sin. It's natural to walk in the flesh. When you go home tonight, the natural thing to do will be to live in the flesh. We have to want the Spirit to fill us in order to be filled with the Spirit. The second reason that we often, because we have, especially men, I was, I've was i been reading an article, a series of articles recently. Uh, why is it that so many American churches are dominated by women attending, was the question. And I, looking around here, we have about an equal split of men and women here. Uh, and we did in Mongolia, too, at our church there, Faith Baptist Church. But I do know many churches in Mongolia, and, and I've seen some churches here in the United States. You'll be 60, 65, 75% women attending fewer men. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why that is. Because as men, we like to be independent. We like to do it ourselves. I don't need help. That's why, typically, we joke about this, but when you're traveling somewhere, the wife will say, why don't you pull over and ask for directions? And the husband, I know where I'm going. Right? Now, with GPS, it's a lot different, but I remember when my wife and I were first married, didn't have a GPS, you know, and driving around and I would say, let's just pull over and ask for directions. No, 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 no. We're going to go, I, 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 it's, it's just right up here, right? We're independent. And you know what? That independence keeps us from being thirsty because we say, God, I don't need you. There's a third reason I think that we're not thirsty. And the third reason we're not thirsty is because our lives are filled with distractions. I'm talking about things that are, you know, good distractions. I'm not talking about doing evil. I'm not talking about, yeah, we can go down to the bar and, and you know, throw down a drink. No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, yeah, we can, you know, go out and shoot some pool for money. I'm not talking about gambling. I'm just talking about our lives are filled with distractions. Let's imagine that tomorrow you had a day off. Now, I know some of you men, some of you ladies, especially you mothers, you never have a day off. I mean, when there isn't work to do at your place where you get paid, you work at home. Some of you mothers. I mean, when does a, let's imagine you had a day off. There was no responsibilities. Everyone was going to take care of themselves and you could do what you wanted. Could you fill up that 24 hours with nothingness? Easily. Easily. Uh, you can play games on your phone. Right? And I, I've seen... Young people, and it's not just young people, but I think they're more used to having a phone with them. They have a few minutes and they just start playing with their phone. When I was growing up, it was uh, Walkmans. Remember the little device that played tapes? Some of you don't remember tapes. There's these magnetic strips of stuff and you'd put it in this little case and you close it, turn it on, you put on your headphones and you could listen to music and no one else had to know what you were listening to or be disturbed by it. Now, about 10 years before that, you had these big, they called them boom 
boxes. Now, that's really going back. But they had, they, yeah, they carry They carry these boom boxes. The problem with the boom boxes is it, everyone around you could hear the music you were listening to. But here's my point. You can be distracted all day by music, by games, by videos, by, you, you name it. You can find it. And we're not craving the Holy Spirit. We're not thirsty for the Holy Spirit because we're distracted. Some of us are not craving the Holy Spirit because we're disturbed by the storms of life. We're just, we're bothered. I, someone was re recently telling me, uh, they were visiting, not anyone here at the church, they were visiting uh, someone they watch the news for three or four hours a night, they said. Wow. Listen, don't, don't do that. Please. Yeah, that is going to mess your mind. <laughs> okay, you do need to know what's going on. We are going to have an election in November, even though Trump said he wanted to postpone it, which is funny. I, I've got to say this. You remember when Trump suggested postponing the election? Democrats, I mean, they just came off their handles. Man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You recently heard that, uh, maybe didn't, Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, the leader there in Hong Kong, has postponed elections in Hong Kong by a whole year. I'm still waiting for Nancy Pelosi to come out and condemn her for <laughs> elections. Okay. <laughs> Don't spend hours watching the news because you will be disturbed by the storms. There are serious storms in America, but you're not going to solve them by watching the news. You're not going to solve them by complaining to your neighbor. You're not going to solve them by, you know, sitting down and writing a letter, although you should write to your representatives. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't, don't think you're going to solve the problem by writing a letter. You're going to solve the problem by getting on your knees before God and asking for his help. We don't crave the Holy Spirit because we're disturbed by the storms of life. I, I, I'll end here. <clears throat> this is, uh, we're not craving the Holy Spirit because some of us are holding on to bitterness. Now, if you're not a person who's disturbed by bitterness, people like me, you don't get it. I'm sorry. But if you have a bent, a sinful bent towards bitterness, you know that bitterness can end up eating you alive. This came to my attention. I was 12 years old when my grandmother died. My mom's mom passed away. She had cancer. I was 12 years old when she passed away, and so we went down. She lived in Southern California. We went down to Southern California, and they had a wake where the family gathered. The body was there in the funeral home, and we gathered. Um, and we went, my family went, and uh, I, I heard all these people talking. And many of them were saying, I wish I would have called her. We haven't talked for five years because she said something I didn't like. Or, we haven't talked for two years because I was mad that she... Why? These are family members. They're eaten up by... And so we say, fine, I just, I just won't talk to God. I mean, you're not going to lose your salvation. Don't misunderstand me. You're still going to get to heaven. I, that, you know, that's important. But you're going to miss out on the Holy Spirit flowing out of you like rivers of living water because you just, you're just not going to talk to God. I have a friend, again, not here, but a friend. He, he's decided he doesn't want to talk to God. He's bitter. And I, I confronted him. I said, you're bitter. Yeah, but people are so stupid. Yeah, I am too. Other people keep you from talking to God. I mean, when are people going to get smart? Not this side of eternity. Don't allow bitterness to quench your thirst. It's like getting to the river. I mean, you walk through a desert. You find the river. There's plenty of cool water flowing by. It's clean. You're not going to get any disease from it. And you say, I'm not going to drink it because I'm mad at God. I'm sorry, you're not helping yourself. You're not helping God. You just you're 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 drying up spiritually. And and I met Christians. I have no doubt that their sins are forgiven and, and that they have eternal life. They're Christians, best I can tell. But they're dried up spiritually. Don't be that type of Christian. 
Look at verse 37 again. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst. Are you craving the Holy Spirit tonight? Do you thirst for those rivers of living water to flow through you? Do you want that love and that meekness and that joy? Do you want temperance in your life? Do you want your faith to grow? Do you want to be good, just goodness to people who really, truly love your enemies? You're going to need the Holy Spirit. So do you, desire, do you crave the Holy Spirit? Because if you don't thirst, you don't go to Jesus. We're going to talk about that next week. How do we get to Jesus when we're thirsty? But I'm afraid is. joy or peace, not fountains that enable us to live that Holy Spirit filled life of, 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 of bold witness but we say well, we're satisfied. Don't be that type of Christian. Father in heaven, I'm, I'm burdened for myself, for my wife, for my children. I'm burdened for my church, for Elmira Baptist Church. It's not my church, it's Jesus' church but for the church to that you've called me to minister to. I'm burdened for other churches in California. Churches across the United States, some that I know. I'm burdened for the churches that I know in Mongolia and around the world, that there would be a fresh pouring out of your Holy Spirit, that there would be a renewal of that spiritual life and vitality that we had when we were first saved. That there would be a Holy Spirit filling that would change who we are and that the people around us they would they would know they, they couldn't help unbelievers couldn't help but see there's something different Father I know that you are holy and you are just and you must judge sin I look back at history at the great revivals that averted your judgment and I, I it seems so obvious to me that you do not send your Holy Spirit in a fresh way on your people. That we are headed for destruction as a nation. And Lord, I, I just remind you that you've been glorified before when you sent your Holy Spirit again. Not that we ever lose the Holy Spirit, but you energized us to sing your praises, to be bold witnesses, to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit been so glorified during those times. And we want to see you exalted again. We want to see your, your word honored and revered. We want people to say, thus saith the Lord, and others to sit up and take notice. We want our enemies and their plots and machinations thrust down. We want them to fall into the pit that they've dug for us so that you'll be honored and glorified by protecting we ask, Father, that you would give each one who's listening tonight, those that are here, those that are at home, that you'd give us a sincere craving for the Holy Spirit, that we would be thirsty for what only he can give us. We would be thirsty for that power from on high, that Pentecostal power, that we would be thirsty once again to see your Holy Spirit poured out People change, their lives change. Atheists come to Jesus. Drunkards come to Jesus. The wicked come to Jesus. Again, not so that we are glorified, but so you are glorified. That's our, that's our heart, Lord, and we know that's your Holy Spirit. So as you did in the days of Jonathan Edwards, and John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, as you did in the did in the days of Charles Finney, D.L. Moody, Lord, as you did in the days of Billy Sunday and Mordecai Ham, we ask, we beg you, Father, for that spirit of revival, that spirit of the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit to flow through us. And we lift these prayers, these petitions to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our uh, song tonight near the cross 137 stand with me if you would